Hello everyone and welcome back to Computer Vision Lecture Series. Uh, this is Lecture 8, Part 1. In this lecture, we are going to talk about uh, dense motion estimation. Uh, these slides are based on these uh, references. You can look up uh, them if you want to take a deeper look into um, this topic, dense motion estimation. But otherwise, uh, for, uh, for the purposes of our uh, course, and uh, the content that we are co covering, uh, the slides, uh, this slide is enough. Okay, so what do we define? Uh, what do we mean by uh, motion estimation? So in motion estimation, we have to determine computationally the flow of uh, our object of interest. And uh, what does dense mean? Uh, in, in dense means that for each and every pixel we have to find this flow and uh, usually it is done in a video or um, it could be a small animation or a gif where there are at least two different frames to compute uh, this flow from so uh, where does this flow comes from usually the flow or the motion that comes from either the object moves or the camera moves uh, so if you are changing the position or location of your camera then the there is an apparent motion or if the object itself moves when the camera is steady uh, in this case for example on the left hand side you see a car here and uh, this is uh, a flow field or the flow of, uh, generated by this car in a small video um, how do we determine this flow is through some vectors which which show you the strength and the direction of this flow uh, around this object and uh, this kind of flow field generate generated flow field uh, is called motion estimation or um, a flow of this uh, object uh, basically we are trying to quantify the object motion uh, in uh, computationally and that's uh, what we call uh, as flow okay and uh, another uh, reason where the flow can also come from is uh, camera movement so if your image is uh, stationary um, you uh, and you and if you generated another image just um, by moving your camera then the flow can result from that as well uh, by estimating the uh, this flow uh, we can estimate the magnitude or the relative depth of um, the objects inside the image and uh, therefore um, flow estimation or motion estimation is um, useful for uh, depth estimation as well as in this case we can see uh, the flow field here is generated mm, and you can see that the higher or the more stronger field are visible in the trunk of this uh, tree whereas uh, lower or very uh, less magnitude fields are seen in around the sky areas or objects which are farther away from the camera and this ha this is due to the perspective uh, view of the camera because uh, when you um, translate or transform 3d object into 2d image plane um, the objects which are closer to the image plane uh, will show a higher magnitude of flow or motion estimation or motion fields and uh, objects which are farther away will show uh, lower values of motion fields typically basically as you see here um, the dense estimate um, of all the pixel values is considered as dense and it is not only for one particular feature like the trunk of the tree or the house but it is actually for every pixel in the image. There are different applications for generic motion estimation as well as dense motion estimation. Um, we will see uh, some examples now of uh, what it means to have this kind of uh, a flow or uh, trying to compute this flow. Um, so motion estimation can be also interchangeably be also called uh, optical flow. These two things are uh, used uh, in conjunction with one another um, more often than not. There is a slight difference between them. We'll look at them later in the slides. But what is optical flow? Optical flow is essentially the apparent movement or motion of objects or surfaces 
uh, across uh, frames and uh, optical flow will generate uh, the vector fields which is just um, how much which is an uh, which is an uh, value of how much the pixel move from one image to the other another image in this case you can see a rubik's cube lying on a white surface and um, this is uh, like a rotating body here and you can see clearly that the whole um, the rubik's cube along with the surface has moved or made a counterclockwise uh, rotation and this is another um, instance of that rotation uh, you can see from these features here at the bottom of this uh, plate that this plate has moved along with the rubik's cube here however uh, we optical flow is able to only detect the apparent motion of the rubik's cube and the features which are visible in the bottom of the plate but there are no fe visible features it's basically a white surface on this plane and therefore there are no motion fields or optical flow uh, estimated for that uh, we know that the plate has moved but because there are there is an absence of uh, features there optical flow was not able to estimate the um, flow for those for these surfaces uh, whereas in case of rubik's cube it is clear uh, that the rubik's cube here if you zoom in and see uh, you will see a lot of the arrows pointing on the right hand side showing that the object has moved uh, from one image to the other on the right hand side similarly at the bottom of the plate you can see that there are um, optical flow with higher magnitudes um, oriented towards the right hand side direction and anti-clockwise direction here going towards uh, top left and this on the left hand side of the plate you can see that the flow is coming from uh, top left uh, sorry here i meant uh, top right it, the these arrows are pointing towards top right so and here you can see that these arrows are uh, coming from the top left so it's kind of showing you um, how the plate has moved in an anti-clockwise uh, direction similarly in the case of the car here we also see that in some parts of the car where there are there are white surfaces it's not easy to locate um, or estimate the optical flow so optical flow really relies on um, features uh, present in one image towards or over the other image and motion sometimes is uh, the only cue and it's not so easy to see uh, for the machines but for us it's quite simple to understand or visualize this motion for example in this case you see an image of uh, noisy pixels here now if you saw that there is an apparent motion from one image to the other you can see that there is a square in middle which is moving right it's quite easy for us to see but for a machine it's not easy to see and this kind of perceptual motion is um, also important and has to be considered while uh, doing motion estimation i want to continue by talking about some perceptual uh, motions so for example even if we have data uh, in like this where there are some random points visible on the screen uh, however it's uh, it could be random points but uh, when you look at uh, when you show some motion along this point you can see an apparent uh, moment here that it's a motion of a person walking and this kind of perceptual or uh, motion is possible even with the minimum amount of data and it can uh, give us strong uh, estimates for uh, motion as well and this also need to be considered while uh, doing motion estimation and um, yeah um, so what are the problems generally faced uh, for um, motion estimation uh, one of them is uh, aperture problem so what does it mean so aperture is this opening of the camera with which you are capturing the image and if you are only recording a certain part of the image and not able to see the whole uh, image in context or the whole uh, or a more uh, broader view of the image then you can have a um, misestimation or a wrong estimation for the motions uh, uh, computed motion for example here 
this line has uh, the shape has moved on the right hand side whereas if we look through the aperture for example in this case we see that the line has moved from the bottom left to the top right which is not the case right um, the, the case is that the shape has moved on the towards the right so this is one problem faced by motion estimation another one is uh, called the barber pole illusion which is similar to the previous one if you are um, if you if the if the aperture or the or the f or field of view is very low um, here it can give you a wrong motion information as well what's happening here is you, we see that there are uh, some lines which are uh, moving from the top left towards the bottom right however they are simply uh, rotation uh, over a cylinder and if you are looking it at from a, an aperture perspective um, from through a particular small size fixed size aperture it can give you um, it, uh, a perception of uh, movement in the wrong direction so the barber pole illusion is another problem that can be faced uh, for motion estimation okay so before this we saw how uh, we were using motion flow and optical flow interchangeably here we will uh, focus a bit more on the same aspect so uh, motion is associated motion, motion flow is associated with the objects themselves if they are moving and optical flow is the apparent um, or the perceptual um, um, perceptual uh, understanding of the motion basically if we see some features moving then can we compute that or not that is um, in from a computational sense that is optical flow however not necessarily the object has to move in that case an example here is on the left hand side uh, you can see a sphere and you can see the reflection of the sun on the sphere and this sphere is uh, quite smooth with uh, uniform surface uh, reflectance and it's moving uh, in the counterclockwise direction um, so here there is a motion flow of the object whereas uh, there is no optical flow because this reflection will not change and even though the sphere rotates uh, there is no optical flow on the other hand uh, on the right hand side there is a movement of the sun whereas the sphere is fixed so what we see here is uh, we will see here is that this uh, reflection will move from this point to over somewhere here and this will create an op uh, apparent optical flow but the sphere is fixed so there is no motion flow this is the basic difference between optical flow and motion flow um, depending on the application we have to con consider what we can use uh, or what we are aiming to estimate Another example of uh, the differences between the optical flow and the motion flow is, is an often used assumption is that translation is a parallel to the image plane um, will give us a wrong perception sometimes. So let's say if your car, here, uh, this is your image plane and your car moves from this point towards the right hand side. Here all the pixels in the car are moving in one direction together in with the same magnitude so every point has moved with a fixed magnitude on the right however this is this assumption is not true or in every case sometimes we have we make this assumption but this um, incorrect because we will see why um, because this kind of motion or this kind of, kind of assumption um, ignores parallax effects what do we mean here so let's say there is a cube here which moves on the right hand side like this now due to parallax the depth uh, or the objects or the parts of this square or the cube which are away from the camera give a lesser or, or travel lesser distance in 2d image plane than the um, surface points which are in the front of this cube so you can see 
uh, that the objects or the points which are closer to the camera have moved longer or more further than the points which are in the um, uh, behind or at the far end of the cube uh, so there is no um, so if there is a so we cannot make this parallel uh, we cannot make this assumption of uh, that that translation which is parallel to the image plane uh, will always move all the pixels in the image uh, with the fixed magnitude which is not true closer objects move faster and uh, distance one di distant ones move slower uh, another issue or another aspect of motion is uh, when the motion is towards yourself or away from yourself for example in this case uh, this car is moving towards you or towards us and because of this we generate a radical or a radial optical flow which is going away from the object this kind of optical flow does not give us much information but we but because we know that um, this kind of motion can generate this kind of optical flow we can safely assume that this object is uh, is probably approaching in the reverse case if the object was going away the optical flow uh, vectors will be directed inside and this kind of motion uh, becomes a radial optical flow basically shows us a radial optical flow um, another issue uh, is that if you fix the uh, so if there is a movement of the camera around in a rotational form for example here you are taking an image of this uh, rectangle from the left hand side and if you rotate and go towards the right and take a same image of the camera uh, of the square from the right hand side then there is no direct uh, translation where each and every pixel has moved with a fixed uh, motion or a fixed magnitude so there are different aspects to motion flow as well as optical flow when uh, considering uh, to compute the motion flow uh, one of the applications of uh, motion estimation is image alignment here our aim is to align two different images taken at uh, taken uh, two Im different images captured of the same um, scene from a different uh, perspective so we want to basically generate a single v translation for the entire image that translates this image towards the uh, right hand image so uh, here the assumption again here we make the assumption is that um, the entire image has uh, the same translation value so the optical flow values will be the same for each and every pixel and this is typically an easier problem to solve than general motion estimation because here we are assuming uh, some fixed values of the optical flow and uh, using Lucas Kennedy methods we can easily compute this kind of uh, image alignment where you can uh, join different images another uh, application is mosaicing or input images where you have different images taken from so this is uh, these are a set of different images taken from a drone of an airport apparently uh, I'll, uh, across uh, six different frames and because these all objects are quite far away from the camera so their depths or their distances from the camera are assumed to be constant uh, although it is not but given the high altitude of the image capturing device the drone in this case for example is quite uh, large than the inter pixel distances between the objects lying here it is safe to do the or assume that kind of um, uh, assumption and so using the this information we can compute or uh, join these images for example here you can see this um, on the right hand side this uh, image feature overlaps with the right hand uh, on the left hand side of this image feature similarly um, you can see uh, for every image you will find some overlap of one image over the other and then you can just do a stitching of this image where you can generate a final mosaicing which uh, is a simple and straightforward given the assumptions that we have made okay so 
what we have talked about is a basic translational motion where we have assumed the optical flow values to be uh, constant across entire images and um, one of the application is as uh, image stabilization where you are taking an image of an uh, or take an image of a scene where you have a small shake or a movement of your camera where um, the assumption is made that um, all the pixels are moving with a fixed um, value and therefore the new cameras what we have now even in your mobile phones have image stabilization software built in so when you are whenever you are taking a camera even with jerks or uh, sh uh, sudden random movements of your camera device the image uh, does not get blurred and this is uh, one uh, direct application of this translational motion um, this can happen with walking cameraman for our camera shakes so on and so forth um, as I said simple assumption that we have made is all pixels move by the same amount um, more realistically if you are doing uh, object tracking or your focus is on a particular aspect of the image certain feature or certain um, region then um, you have to subtract the background from the foreground or you have to focus your attention towards the object that you are interested in for this motion and um, this is the assumption of a lot of many video coders um, however it requires a separation of background and foreground objects um, one direct application or one direct way of uh, doing this background subtraction is first you take a, an image of the background so you get a background model uh, and you fix that background and then you start your or insert your object in that and when you take a difference this different uh, when you take a difference of this input and the background um, uh, you will generate a motion field which is associated with your foreground uh, objects and using proper thresholding you can generate uh, a mask or a field values which show how much the um, foreground object is moving with respect to your background uh, the problem with this is that sometimes there is a lot of spurious noise present in the um, estimation or even during calculating these differences as you can see there are some random dots white dots uh, visible and we don't want them so you do uh, some sort of uh, post processing on those output masks where, where you use simple image processing techniques like uh, erosion or dilation we have looked into these techniques and we know now that in order to remove the small um, blobs or the small uh, spurious noise you can use this um, erosion followed by dilation which is basically closing and uh, you can remove this spurious noise uh, from your uh, generated masks okay so how do we compute uh, the errors so what um, why do we need error metrics um, the main the main um, the main mo uh, motivation to use error metrics is to find uh, the differences between two these uh, successive frames or the video frames or these two successive images that you have for estimating uh, motion so let's say you have two different images i0 and i1 x shows the position of the pixel values there now we are what we are interested in to find this uh, translation of this one image towards the to to the other image is finding a u vector which is uh, u and v denotes like the x and y directions uh, which minimizes the difference between the um, uh, the i1 and uh, i i0 because if we are so essentially what we are doing is we are converting this um, translational motion into a minimization problem where we have to estimate the value of u such that it minimizes the differences between these two images and that's our intention right uh, in order to find this translation but how can we measure uh, this differences between two images so that is where the error metrics come in that's the motivation here so you move um, your second image with a small motion u and you take a difference of those values with the original image and you accumulate in uh, in, a, in a value 
which is called uh, squ sum of squared distances and uh, this will give you um, how much error or the quantity in, in a quantitative sense how much is um, the difference between these two images and uh, it gives you a reference value of how much you want to minimize this value uh, ideally you would prefer uh, the best solution is if the error is zero then you have um, it means that you have uh, faithfully estimated the value of u it's not a simple straightforward um, um, minimization problem but it, uh, the way we have formulated here is uh, just uh, finding um, uh, in, in a, uh, finding the value of u through minimizing this um, uh, error values up until now i forgot to mention that we are assuming that all the images are black and white in um, or grayscale um, so that it's easier to compute these differences and the motions and the optical flow However, you can just use uh, all the image channels and aggregate their sums or the errors or even you can use or transform this Im uh, color image into uh, YCBCR or YUV image, uh, um, image um, sp color space and you can use the e luminance or the intensity values to compute this uh, differences which is also fine. Okay, uh, so how do this SSD metric behave so they have uh, smaller errors for um, uh, pixels which have moved uh, in a smaller distance value whereas for pixels which are moving uh, too far uh, too much they have a larger errors and these larger errors as you can see are increasing uh, exponentially um, so basically by looking at this curve you can see that um, the sum of square distances is tolerant towards um, less important or lower value of the errors so if you have moved from 5 pixels to 6 pixel it the um, the error is not too high but if if you have moved from 20 to 30 pixel the error is uh, much higher and the um, the error metric is much higher so um, this is easier for minimization but the b uh, biggest downside is that the um, uh, it's not very robust for example there are a lot of um, pixels which have moved or, or which gives very small error let's say that there are 50 pixels which give uh, which move or which give a, a error pixel value of 1 so you have 50 as your value for the the error right whereas there is a, a pixel which has moved in uh, moved by 60 pixel and that one pixel itself will give you an error value of 60 so a combination of 50 small error values is lower than a just single large error and therefore larger errors dominate the ssd metric and therefore we can say that uh, this metric is not robust uh, for uh, considering this uh, differences in uh, the errors so we need a bit more uh, robust metric right um, instead of doing a sum of squared distances we can take the sum of absolute differences this gives us a bit more robust as compared uh, this gives us a bit more robustness as compared to the SSD metric why because you can see the shape of the curve here that the error does not grow exponentially it grows linearly so large errors do not dominate as much as they did for the SSD metric however they still do dominate and there might be some noises for example here we saw that there are some spurious uh, noise in the background and these values can dominate or give large errors and we still do not want that um, that they dominate in our error metric as um, more specifically what we want is that if there are um, uh, pix uh, error or the pixel values which are closer to our region of interest um, or farther from our region of interest both of these are error metrics for us right uh, we don't want them to give two different values of error 
we want to set a threshold that let's say we set a threshold that our re region of interest is um, this mass and everything away from this mass if there is an error it gives us a constant error so can we do that that's the question um, but before we talk about the solution one of the po potential solution uh, until now for ssd and sad these two norms are considered as lp norms the generic form is written in this manner if you take p equals to 2 it gets converted to uh, ssd if you take p equals to 1 it gets converted into sad so we are seeing here that if you decrease the value or of p uh, you are making uh, a curve which is uh, punishing larger errors very much slower slowly so as you move uh, more farther away the larger errors are getting uh, dominated more slowly in terms of uh, when you decrease the value of p where this is called to, um, uh, so it does it, it makes sense and computationally or practically it is uh, it is what we want to achieve right um, but it is not a norm those things will not be considered as norm um, and this is some mathematical concept where if p values are less than one they are not considered norms uh, it's not directly relevant to our um, uh, problem but it is important to note okay so we were talking about some general more robust functions which can help us um, give a constant value of errors for errors which are larger than a threshold value right and this is in general called a general function is called a sum of robust distances what here we do is um, uh, after a certain distance the errors whether it is 50 pixels or 100 pixels they are, the error metric is penalized only with a fixed value as you can see the uh, error is growing more slowly for larger distances and therefore we focus our interest in the lower error regions and one of these uh, robust kernel functions for generating the sum of robust distances is uh, a gaiman maclaur kernel here if you plot this curve it looks on something like uh, on the right hand side it's not exactly the same curve but it looks uh, uh, the shape is similar and this is what we want our error metric to behave like so for example if there is no uh, the, if the error value is zero that is ideally what we want but if the er error values are higher for lower movement of the pixel we don't want them to be um, punished um, or their values to be too high and if their the pixel movements are very high we don't want those values to dominate our error metric and this curve this kind of curve error curve um, takes care of it okay up until now we have not considered or not focused our attention to the region of interest that we are focused in so it is po it is quite possible that um, there are some regions of image in one frame which are not present in the other or they go outside of the image basically and in those cases basically the errors will jump uh, to a large value so instead of uh, doing that what we do is we generate masks uh, so w0 mask w0 is a mask for i0 image and w1 is a mask for i1 image um, uh, remember that these two images could be two frames uh, sec in, in succession or two animated um, or, or two frames of uh, animation video or something like that and what we call here w is a windowed uh, squared robust distance what happens here is in each of these images we apply this mask over the image so that our focus is only on the object of interest let's say for example in our initial example where we want to more uh, estimate this motion of this car for example then we create a window function here which only takes or considers value for this car and neglects every other um, pixel value essentially what we have to do is we have to multiply this whole image with a windowed function uh, where every other pixel will be uh, considered zero value 
and that is what um, the windowed uh, the, 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 the W stands for windowed uh, squared robust distance. Here you can see that we apply the mask over the zeroth image or in the first image and then you compute the robust uh, distances. Um, essentially counting the differences only where these pixels uh, only where these masks are present. So we are focusing our interest in those regions of uh, the image where we want to track a person or an object and things like that. But it's possible in this case also that uh, the number of pixels are higher and because of it the error grows unboundedly and we can have a large error value. In order to just uh, keep it at the lowest what we do is we divide our error with the area of the mask and that's how uh, basically it's a, com it's a multiplication of uh, these two masks uh, which shows that it will be uh, so A is an area of the overlap of these two masks in these two images um, and therefore uh, we are normalizing the value of this uh, error metric so that it does not grow unboundedly. Okay, so what's the advantage of using robust uh, distances is sometimes images are not taken with the same exposure, the, uh, sometimes the aper aperture changes or even the camera changes or the, uh, the time of the day when you want to take the image changes and so on and so forth. So in this case, maybe it becomes more cloudy, maybe it, there is a sun coming out because of the clouds and things like that. So it, there are things which are not in our control. However, in these cases, it's not easy to compute or compare the images uh, in their color spaces. So we need a better mapping that can map our um, this changed luminance or a changed exposure or different camera image to the original one, right? We need a kind of a linear map. And, there, and here we um, assume that uh, I0 is transformed to alpha I0 plus beta then the SSD error will become something like this. However, here we have to determine alpha and beta such that this error is minimized. Now, it's like a minimization of the minimization problem. So we are a bit complicating our um, error estimation or most, sorry, most motion estimation by complicating our error metric. Here, first we have to estimate alpha and beta and then we have to estimate u. So it's like a minimization of a minimization problem which makes it a bit more complicated. So a simpler, more direct solution is to directly use a cross correlation between the two images. So we have seen what a cross correlation means. Uh, we have also seen what autocorrelation means. Cor cross correlation, why uh, the reason the term cross correlation here is used is because it is not with the same image. It's an image, uh, it's, it's co uh, correlation between two images which are translated by a value of u. So we are, our um, optimization problem is to determine the value of u. Um, what we do here is basically multiply these two images and compute their cross correlation. And essentially, instead of minimizing this cross correlation, what we want to do is have a maximum value of this cross correlation. Why? Because if the cross correlation value is maximum, it means that the images are overlapping quite uh, perfectly or the way you want them to be to find this correlation or to find this mapping between uh, or to join or um, things like that for the motion. So in that case, your U value is estimated. So basically, uh, that's what a cross correlation does. Uh, even with cross correlation, you can have a normalization issue. So what we do is essentially we subtract the mean from both the images of each image and then divide it by that as well to make it more uh, robust. And now you can use this uh, technique for even when the pictures were taken with different exposures, cameras, different settings, different time of the day. And that's it for now. Um, in the next part of this lecture, we will continue talking about um, uh, translation motion and we will see how we can solve uh, that motion. Thank you very much.